a school under siege. And the school is in a panic. I've got students down under the table, kids. Heads under the table. Two students launch a deadly assault on Columbine High. Oh, God. Stay on the line of the table. Oh, God. Hey, kids, just stay down. The whole time, I just pretended to be dead. It is the worst school shooting in American history. There were a total of 15 bodies. There were 11 males and uh, four females. As families grieve, there are questions about the rage. I'm gonna pull out a shotgun and blow your damn head off. That drove these young men you to murder. Do, I'll rip off your head. And whether warning signs were missed. When you start putting all these pieces together to the puzzle, then you're saying, boy, there's a red flag. The questions and answers. The story behind the Columbine Massacre, next on The Final Report. April 20th, 1999. Jefferson County, Colorado, 1110 AM. It is a typical morning at Columbine High. About 2,000 students attend school here, near the affluent Denver suburb of Littleton. 16-year-old sophomore Marjorie Lindholm is about to take a science test. It was an average morning. Everything was fine. I had a big test I was kind of nervous about, and I was supposed to kind of meet a boy that day who I had a crush on. Some students are headed for lunch. This footage from a camera that monitors lunchtime activities shows the cafeteria slowly filling up. Within minutes, there will be 500 people in this room. 11.14 a.m. No one notices when someone leaves two duffel bags on the floor of the cafeteria. 11.19 a.m. Outside the school's west entrance, 17-year-old Richard Castaldo is eating lunch with 17-year-old Rachel Scott. As they talk, a pipe bomb lands a few feet from where they sit. I didn't really realize it was supposed to be a bomb at first. I kind of thought it was like a thing of fireworks or something like that. It didn't, it didn't do anything at all. I didn't really think much of it. Then about 60 feet away, Castaldo sees two male teenagers. They are dressed in long black trench coats. Without warning, they pull weapons from under their coats. One has a rifle and a sawed-off shotgun. The other has a sawed-off shotgun and a semi-automatic handgun. Their actions raise the first of many questions to be investigated by the final report. How were teenagers able to get weapons like these? And then they just, you know, started shooting. And I, I didn't really have any time to react at all, you know. They shoot Castaldo's friend, Rachel Scott, four times. She dies instantly. Castaldo is shot eight times. The bullets shatter two vertebrae. He begins to lose feeling in his legs. I felt my, you know, my feet going numb and my legs going numb. Kind of seemed like it was going from, like, the top up. Who are the gunmen? While Castaldo lies motionless in the grass, three students walk out of a cafeteria door. One of the gunmen aims and fires. He hits all three. The pair then shoots two more students as they run for cover. How did the gunman learn to shoot with such accuracy? Inside the classrooms, students begin to realize what is happening. We were taking the test, and then we heard what we thought were rocks being thrown against the window. And then we heard a bunch of screaming. In the main office, a secretary alerts Principal Frank DeAngelis. And my secretary uh, ran into my office and said that there had been gunshots fired. And so I ran out of my office into the hallway. Police issue a citywide call for help. 1,000 officers in the area race toward the school. The gunmen now turn and head toward this entrance. As they do, they fire shots into the school and litter their path with pipe bombs. Where did the gunmen get these bombs? 11.24 a.m. 
A Jefferson County Sheriff's deputy is first on the scene. He exchanges gunfire with one of the shooters, but no one is hit. School principal Frank DeAngelis is standing at the opposite end of the hall as the two enter the school. That's where I saw the gunman enter, and that's where the shots were being fired, and then the glass was breaking behind me. Upstairs, 17-year-old Patrick Ireland and two friends are in the library. We're just hanging out, and all of a sudden, a teacher ran in to the library, uh, screaming and yelling, saying there's two kids with guns out in the hallway. 11.25 AM, teacher Patty Nielsen reaches the library. She grabs the phone and dials 911. I have a teacher calling my high school. There is a student here with a gun. And the school is in a panic. And I'm in the library. I've got students down under the table, kids. Heads under the table. We need to wait here. OK. By now, the gunmen are inside the main hallway. Teacher Dave Sanders, who has just made his way up from the cafeteria, is at the end of the hall. They see Sanders and fire. He falls to the floor. Sanders is dragged into a nearby classroom where a group of terrified students is hiding. One of those students is 16-year-old Marjorie Lindholm. Two teachers helped him into the room. He had one arm over each, and they, he half walked and half was dragged in, um, and he just kind of collapsed. He had been shot twice, um, and he had been bleeding very, very badly. 11.29 a.m. The gunmen enter the library. 52 students, two teachers, and two library workers are hiding under tables. Among them is 16-year-old Craig Scott, the younger brother of Rachel Scott, who was shot and killed near the west entrance. Immediately, they were shooting off their guns, and they were yelling at everybody in the room. One of them said to the other, get anybody with a white hat on. And a lot of jocks wore white baseball caps, and I was wearing one. And so I took it off, and I put it underneath my shirt. For the next seven minutes, the two walk through the library, shooting students. Their methodical actions raise the question, what is their plan? Patrick Ireland is with two friends, hiding under a table in the corner of the library. When they got to our section, we all had our heads down in between our knees, basically. One gunman fires his shotgun, hitting Patrick's friend in the knee. As Patrick reaches over to assist him, his head momentarily appears from beneath the table. And that's when I got shot. Um, got shot twice in the head and once in the foot. Patrick loses consciousness. Craig Scott is under another table with two friends, 18-year-old Isaiah Scholes and 16-year-old Matt Kector. After a little while, they came over and they saw my friend Isaiah, and they began to make fun of him for being black. And then they shot Isaiah, and then they shot Matt. And the whole time, I just, um, just pretended to be dead. April 20th, 1999, 11.40 a.m. Police and emergency personnel from five counties are racing to Columbine High School. Jefferson County is getting shots fired at officers. Two males in trench coats have shotguns and possible grenades. Among the responding officers is Dan Delmonico, a member of the Denver Police Department SWAT team. The information coming in over the radio is alarming. It was a military-type assault on the school. Uh, that They may have uh, explosives and uh, automatic weapons. As police arrive, the gunmen make their way to the cafeteria. Outside, a student gives police an important piece of information. He recognized one of the shooters as a Columbine senior, 18-year-old Eric Harris. At the DA's office, a computer check reveals that Eric Harris has a police record. His file contains the name of 17-year-old Dylan Klebold, also a Columbine senior. The pair had been arrested for breaking into a van. 
I took one of my chief deputies and we got in my car and we drove to Columbine High School. And I actually went with identifying information for um, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. Students who escaped now confirm that Dylan is the second gunman. In an active shooter situation, you go to the noise, you go to the shooter, you, you neutralize them whatever way you have to, and it's over. 12.34 p.m. Outside near the west entrance, police rescue 17-year-old Richard Castaldo. Castaldo has been lying in the grass for more than an hour after being shot eight times. And it just took me over to like a fire truck there too or something, I remember. I mean, I guess I knew I was okay then, you know, that I, could, I was actually gonna, you know, I was actually gonna live at that point. 1.09 p.m. A SWAT team enters the school through a ground floor window near the cafeteria. We were standing in about a foot deep of water and the noise of the fire alarm continuously going on. It was very loud. It was tough to communicate with the officers. Police find roughly 30 students hiding in the school kitchen. They rush the teens out the same ground floor window they'd entered. But police order the students to keep their hands on their heads. They frisk them before allowing them to leave. We'd gotten information that the, the suspects were changing clothes and trying to blend in with the students. That's why you see the kids with their hands on the head, because we don't know who we have. 1.45 p.m. In the science classroom, teacher Dave Sanders clings to life. Students post a sign in the window. Marjorie Lindholm can't believe help hasn't arrived. It's already been two hours. I wondered what was taking so long because the 911 operator made it sound like they were around the corner every time we asked, where are they? Why does it take so long for help to arrive? As SWAT teams slowly move through the school, they find hundreds of students and teachers barricaded inside classrooms. As you moved into hallways, you would find locked doors as we would breach these doors and enter these rooms and you found people hiding. Uh, when we would come across them, yeah, it would take us a little bit of time to convince them that, no, we're not the bad guys, we're the, we're the cops. 2.38 p.m. In the library, junior Patrick Ireland regains consciousness after being shot twice in the head three hours earlier. I didn't know if they were still in the library or still in the school or if there are more of them coming, but I knew I had to get out. Patrick tries to stand up, but he can't. My whole right side of my body was completely paralyzed. So I ended up rolling over onto my back and pushing myself with my, with my good leg, my left leg, on the floor, weaving through tables and chairs and ultimately um, getting over to the window. Denver SWAT officer Dan Delmonico tells the final report, getting there wasn't easy. We had no maps, we had no direction of the place, and as we started moving, uh, we had nobody telling us, okay, the science room, if you're here, go there. While SWAT officers wait for paramedics to be escorted into the building along a secured path, Sanders dies of his wounds. 3.22 p.m. Almost an hour later, police finally reach the library. Here, they make the most horrifying discovery of all. Denver officer Tom McKibben is among the first to arrive. You see a lot of gru gruesome deaths, but never, you know, in that magnitude. You'd see kids laying face down, some of them on top of each other, next to each other. Then, police find the bodies of Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. There is no doubt they are the gunmen. They are fully armed, surrounded by guns and explosives. They died of self-inflicted gunshot wounds. Why did Eric and Dylan go on their murderous rampage? 
Police begin their investigation by scrutinizing the evidence seized from Eric and Dylan's homes. These items help provide the final report with answers to many questions. But the most pressing is, who were the gunmen? Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold seem to be normal, if occasionally troubled, teenagers. Journalist Dave Cullen investigated the shooting for the online publication Slate.com. He believes reports that painted Eric and Dylan as misfits were incorrect. It's a complete myth that they were outcasts. They had a huge group of friends. They went to Friday night, uh, rock and bowl. Dylan went to the prom. Eric had lots of dates. Eric and Dylan both worked at this local pizzeria and played video games together. Columbine High School principal Frank DeAngelis tells the final report that Eric and Dylan did well in school. They were very adept at using the computers. Uh, they were in a video production class. Eric was in some of our upper level classes. They were good students. FBI Special Agent Dwayne Fusilier says Eric and Dylan wore trench coats during the attack out of necessity. The only reason they had these long coats on was so that both of them could carry a shotgun on a sling and a nine millimeter carbine on a sling without being seen. Of the two, Dylan Klebold, who had an explosive temper, seemed more likely to get into trouble. When Dylan got mad, you would hear about it, he would just erupt. He just went ballistic. Dylan was known to swear at teachers and fight with his boss at the pizzeria. Unlike Dylan, Eric was outgoing and seemingly confident. This video shows Eric flirting with a classmate in the school cafeteria. Eric was known for his calm and deferential behavior. Eric was all, all about minimizing the damage. You know, yes sir, no sir, you know, suck up all he needed to do, say all the right things to get out of there. But in March, Randy and Judy Brown discovered that Eric had his own website. It contained a death threat against their son, Brooks. On his site, Eric wrote, all I want to do is kill as many of you as I can, especially a few people like Brooks Brown. Eric also bragged that he and Dylan had been building and detonating pipe bombs. The Browns filed this report with the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Two weeks later, they followed up by meeting with a detective. According to the Browns, he assured them that there was enough information to investigate Eric for his bomb-making activities. It wasn't until after the Columbine tragedy that the Browns learned police never pursued their investigation. However, according to public records, investigators did draft an affidavit, the first step in obtaining a search warrant. The draft affidavit shows that investigators suspected a connection between Eric and an unsolved pipe bomb case. It read, quote, on February 15, 1998, there was a report of a pipe bomb. The size is consistent with the devices labeled by Harris. That affidavit made it clear that the characteristics of that pipe bomb were identical to the ones he had written about on his webpage. Reporter Kevin Vaughn believes that had police pursued the investigation and searched the Harris home, they might have found pipe bombs and early evidence of the plot. You have to ask yourself whether they would have found things that would have led them to have stopped Columbine from happening. 